Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Ride and Handling, Testing, Modification and Development. What I want to do in today's video is look at the topic of what is good road car handling? And we can turn that around, look at it this way as well. What should you be aiming for when you modify the handling of your road car? Let's take a look. So a bit of background, I've just spent a year writing the book, uh, had the input from four different world-class suspension experts. I've spent 20 years testing new cars, uh, basically having a new car every week to drive and evaluate. And personally, I've had over 40 years of car modification, including modifying every aspect of suspension that you can actually think of. So a bit of background in what I am about to talk about. So basically, I think good car handling has three aspects. A car that handles well is firstly, it's controllable. Secondly, it's predictable. And thirdly, it's progressive. And I'm going to explore each of those in a moment. But before we do that, note that the level of grip is not part of that. It's a separate thing. I think people confuse grip with handling. I like to separate them, separate them because what makes a car controllable, predictable and progressive often has nothing to do with grip. And yet they're so important to car handling. Let's look now at each of those and let's look at some of the characteristics of the car that can give poor results in each of those areas. So firstly, controllable. What do I mean by controllable? Well, fundamentally, it means the car responds to driver inputs. If the car is not responding to driver inputs, surely you can't say it's handling very well. So what are some reasons why cars don't respond to driver inputs? Let's have a look at a few. The first one is pig understeer. Pig understeer is when the car is just plowing forward. You can turn the steering wheel further and it will make no difference. The car just keeps on going straight ahead. By definition, the car is not controllable because it doesn't matter what you do with the steering, doesn't matter what you do with the throttle, it just keeps going straight ahead. Now, what would make a car pig understeer? Well, it might be really bad front tyres, bald tyres in wet weather. It might be a lot of front roll stiffness, which causes uh, a weight transfer that reduces the front grip, things of that sort. But pig understeer, plough understeer is not the only one. What about doughy throttle control? So you move your foot and nothing much happens. Now, if you are cornering on the limit and using throttle to change the attitude of the car, a doughy, unresponsive throttle control reduces your degree of controllability of handling. And so the way the car develops its power and responds to the throttle inputs is a very important part of car handling. A car that is underdamped, undershocked, it will be very, very slow to respond to driver inputs. It won't feel controllable because the initial steering input, for example, will not give a response from the car. You want low shaft speed damping to be quite firm to make the car responsive to your driver inputs. In other words, improving controllability. And of course, in modern cars, an overactive traction control system or stability control system means your control is actually reduced because the car is overriding what you're doing. You might put your foot down to get more power oversteer and the car says, no, that's not happening. We'll take off that power. Or you might put on a little bit of opposite lock and the car says, oh, he's now steering not where we want to go. Let's stop, stop the car and its tracks. So overactive traction and stability control reduce your control, reduce the response of the car to your driver inputs. Now, if you haven't thought of controllability as one of the criteria of good handling, I want you to think about that because that's so important. If the car is not controllable, it cannot, by definition, be handling very well. What about the next one? The next one is predictability, predictable. Being predictable means the car does the same thing in the same situations with the same driver inputs. You might say, well, of course cars do that, but they don't. Lots of cars don't do that. So look at some examples. 
An example of a where a car is unpredictable, is not predictable, is one where in some situations it'll pick up an inside wheel and spin it under power, but in other situations it'll spin both wheels. So think of a rear wheel drive car, you're cornering it, you get on the power, it picks up the inside wheel and spins, the car doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't slide, it just gets slower. But what about if in other situations it then spins both wheels, suddenly you've got massive power oversteer. So whether the car is neutral or whether the car oversteers depends on whether it picks up one wheel and spins it or picks up two wheels or spins two wheels. And in some cars it's quite difficult to tell which way it's going to go. Obviously if you've got a limited slip differential in a car like that you always know it's going to want to spin both wheels and you can predict what it's going to do. But if it does one thing in one situation and does another thing in another situation it becomes so much harder to drive. Another example of where a car is unpredictable is in a front wheel drive which has got strong torque steer. Torque steer is when you put your foot down and the car wants to steer in one direction or the other because of the unequal torque distribution to the wheels. Now torque steer can vary depending on road conditions. So a car might torque steer a lot on wet roads, not torque steer on dry roads. It might torque steer a lot if it's wet under one tyre and not wet under the other tyre. And because of the variation in road conditions, a really powerful torque steering front wheel drive car is quite unpredictable. You're never quite sure what it's going to do. One of my cars, a little uh, turbo uh, Dohatsu, uh, I had uh, a lot of boost and uh, quite small tyres. And that used to torque steer like crazy, but where it was going to go and when it was going to go was always unpredictable. Another thing that gives unpredictability in handling is when you've got an engine that's got a very peaky torque curve. So think of a big turbo on a little engine. Yeah, you get massive peak power results on the dyno, but what happens is the torque curve comes along flat and then the car suddenly comes on boost and the torque curve goes like that. That means, depending on what revs you're going at, what engine revs you're using, moving the throttle down by half an inch might give you a 30% change in power or a 5% change in power or a 100% change in power, depending on where you are on this very peaky torque curve. It's one of the reasons why big turbos and little engines actually make for really poor road cars. They look good on paper, but in real life, trying to steer them on the throttle when you're cornering becomes incredibly difficult. You have to know the engine almost intimately to work out where it is on its torque curve and so what results you're going to get by putting your foot down. Conversely, an EV, because it's got very, very strong torque response everywhere, is far easier to drive on the throttle. You really need a very, very good ice engine to match an EV in terms of throttle control in cornering. Another example where the car is unpredictable is if you have a, a car that brakes quite differently if the brakes are hot or cold. So if you put high performance pads in a road car, you'll find that they typically don't work so well when the brakes are cold. You put your foot down, nothing happens. You put your foot down harder and harder on the brakes and oh, there we are. Whereas for the next corner, because the brakes are hot, it's completely different in its response. And so you'll find that most uh, standard cars, manufacturers cars have got very consistent brakes because the manufacturer has been very careful to ensure that the braking is consistent until they get so hot that they start to lose retardation. But be careful if you're using aftermarket pads, very high performance aftermarket pads in a road car, because often it makes the brakes quite different if they're hot or cold. If you're braking to come up to a corner and you don't know how much braking you're gonna get for a given foot force, obviously the car is unpredictable. And a final one on this, this screen for unpredictability is when you've lowered the car and the car hits bump stops on big bumps. Now, if you're cornering and the front hits a bump stop, you're going to get massive sudden understeer. If you're cornering and the back hits a bump stop on the outside, you're going to get sudden massive oversteer. And when I say sudden, clearly it's lost predictability. So hitting bump stops or even starting to compress bump stops where the suspension rate changes dramatically makes the car unpredictable, whether it stays on the cornering line 
or it starts to jump off the cornering line will depend on mid-corner bumps as you hit those bump stops. That's not something you want. The final of those three criteria is I think you want a car that is progressive. Progressive in the way it lets go. Progressive as it pro pro progresses into understeer. Progressive as it progresses into oversteer. It's not sudden. Sudden cars are really bad road cars because you're cornering, you think, this is good, this is good, this is good, and suddenly you spat off into the scenery. That is not what you want. So what are examples where cars aren't progressive? That sudden breakaway I was just describing, especially in slippery conditions, and the number one culprit for that sudden breakaway is too stiff in roll. Feels really great on grippy, dry surfaces. In wet conditions, suddenly it's a nightmare. You're slipping and sliding everywhere. You just don't have that compliance to get the power down, to get the grip down in wet conditions. Another one where cars aren't progressive because you can't feel what they're doing is when the steering feel is poor. A car with good steering gives you a lot of feedback through the steering as to the level of grip. And I cover this in a lot of detail in the book because it's not really covered in any other book I could find. And that is when you're cornering, you can feel the steering load building up as the forces build. And then when those front tires start to lose grip, the steering feel changes. And if it's really good feedback in the steering, you can feel exactly what the front end grip is doing. You can feel through rotation of the car what the back end grip is doing. And that progressiveness that then is enhanced by the feel is a really important part of vehicle handling. If the steering has no feel, you can't tell what the car's doing. And so then it becomes more sudden because it suddenly goes into whatever it's going to do, slides or, or whatever it might be. The final example on this screen for a lack of progression is aerodynamic lift and straight line stability or instability. And that is the car might be progressive. It might be communicative at low speed, low speed corners. But as you go faster and faster, it changes. And it might become quite a lot more sudden because of aerodynamic lift, you've lost grip. And it might become a lot more sudden because it's straight line instability. You're more easily blown off your course. And so what was a nice progressive corner? You pop over a brow of a hill on this corner and suddenly you, you, you know where you're blown away. That's not progressive, that's sudden. And you don't want sudden cars, especially road cars. So many aftermarket modified cars, in my direct experience of driving modified cars, are not controllable, then especially in terms of things like engine torque curves. They're not predictable. They're grip, 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 and then suddenly they're gone, typically because they're too stiff in roll. And they're not progressive. Uh, they don't have steering feedback. They're not communicating with you as the driver, telling you what's going on. However, in my direct experience, all the best handling X factory cars, standard cars that handle really, really well out the box, have all three. They're controllable, they're predictable, and they're progressive. And I'm not necessarily talking about only expensive sports cars, although they also fall into that category. Uh, I've driven Porsches that are very much like that. I've driven BMWs that are very much like that. But I've also driven Suzuki's that are like that. And I've also driven Mazdas and Rovers that are like that. It's not brand specific. A well set up road car is controllable, predictable and progressive. And that's not the prerogative only of very expensive cars. And neither does your aftermarket car, your modified car, have to ignore all those things. If you have those things in your mind when you're modifying the car, you're aiming for those three things, then you'll have a very, very much sweeter road car. It's all covered in the book, Vehicle Ride and Handling, Testing, Modification and Development. It's a big book. It's uh, over 350 pages, full color, large format. And so it's not a cheap book, but I'm absolutely certain the first time you modify your car and achieve really good outcomes, you'll more than have paid for the cost of the book. It's available from Amazon in your country and it's out right now. Thank you.